All right, so I'm going to do our official. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Canadian Wildlife Federation event, Bees, Butterflies, and Beautiful Pollinators. I'm joining you today. My name's Sarah. And Hi, I'm Brayden. And this is my son, Brayden, and we are, are so happy to welcome Sarah today. She is an expert with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, and she's going to talk to us all about bees and butterflies. Now, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I see that there are lots of people here in the meeting that's live speaking with Sarah, but I know there are even more of you online joining us on YouTube. And I want to welcome all of you to today's uh, event. Now, for those that are here in the room, we're going to be able to ask questions directly of Sarah. She's going to say hello, and she's going to ask us some questions, and she's going to tell us some things, and then we'll have time to, to really get into this stuff. But if you're on YouTube, it doesn't mean you can't ask questions. You can totally ask questions. Just like we were showing, we have our friend Mike is in the back end. You won't see him on camera today, but he's in the back and he's reading your comments and he's helping you sort of stay connected with us here in the event. So if you have a question, please type it in the comments and then Mike's gonna get it over to us. Does that sound good? So Sarah, welcome to our meeting. It's so wonderful to have you. Uh, I'm gonna put you up here on the live, on the big screen so we can all see you. <laughs> Well, can you tell us a little bit about where you are and 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 who you are and and introduce yourself? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So I work with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, and we do all kinds of things. I work on the gardening side, so I love pollinators, and I love telling people about pollinators and seeing how excited they get about pollinators. I've been here for about almost twenty years now. I myself, though, I'm from. Um, I'm coming to you from Carleton Place, Ontario. It's just outside of Ottawa, Ontario. And it's sunny and cool, but it's above zero. So I'm kind of glad about that. I get to go for nice walks. <laughs> and I've started seeing a few little insects coming out. So I love to take a look and see who they are. And That's what's and I'll show That's a really helpful. All right, if I hear a question. Oh, no, I think people are just coming on and getting used to the mute and okay. mute powers. All right, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, how about I um, share my screen now, get that set up so we can yes. start the presentation. No. Okay, share that. And I'm going to go to slideshow. And, so I'm just going to remind everyone to keep their microphones muted until it's time for some questions. Okay. Hang on, I'm move this thing over a bit. Slideshow. All right, can everybody see that okay? Looks great. Okay, so it's with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, we're talking about bees, butterflies, and other pollinators, and just a little bit about us. So we are uh, a national organization, Canada's largest conservation organization. Um, we help Canadians to discover and appreciate and to support all our amazing nature, the plants and the animals in our country. And we also conduct research, conservation projects, and work with decision makers like governments and other organizations to help keep our wildlife and their habitats safe. And today we talk about what pollinators. We love pollinators, one of my favorite topics. And this picture here actually comes from our Wild About Pollinator poster, which I'll talk to you about afterwards if you want to get a copy for yourself. Now, before you get so, deep into it, can you ask answer our, our our question that we had at the very beginning that we had of millions course. there was guess I think the lowest was four and the highest I saw was 35 million so how many okay. types of pollinators do we have in Canada of course so in Canada we've got seven kinds and I'm going to talk about the different seven kinds there are other pollinators um, bats are pollinators in some parts of the world because they feed from flowers but our Canadian bats don't do that so they're not considered a pollinator. So we have bees and wasps, butterflies and moths, beetles, hummingbirds, and did I say seven? Did you say butterflies? Bees and wasps, <laughs> butterflies and moths, <laughs> beetles and hummingbirds. And then, oh my gosh, who's the other one? 
I know them off the top of my head all the time, but when I really need it, I forget one. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to talk about today who, what, what are pollinators? Who are they? Why are they important? Meet some different kinds and then discover what you can do to help them. So first of all, what is a pollinator? So I'm not sure how many of you know that, but pollinators are animals that will transfer pollen from one flower to another. And if you learned about pollination before, you might know that pollen needs to be transferred from one flower to another in order to make the fruits and the seeds that we need. So pollinators will busily go to one flower. They'll get some pollen from the anther part of the flower stuck on their body somewhere. And then they'll travel to another flower. And then they'll actually drop some of that pollen. So they're moving pollen from flower to flower to flower to flower. Now, some flowers do get pollinated by wind. Didn't know if you know that, but some plants like wheat and rye um, that make the greens we eat. And some trees like pine trees, they get pollinated by wind. But a lot of other plants really need these pollinators to pollinate them. But I'm wondering... Do you guys know even why these animals go to the flowers in the first place? Why would they go to the flowers and help with pollination? Brayden, why do you think they go to the flowers? To get nectar from the flowers, to spread it, to pollinate. Ah, to get nectar from them is what, what Brayden's guessing. That's a great answer. They definitely go to get nectar. They also go for another reason. Well, Not sure if anyone like knows. Someone from Ontario is guessing for food? Yes. Yes, so nectar is a kind of food, and they're also wanting to get pollen, which is a kind of food. So they're also doing it for themselves as well as their young. They're getting nectar to drink, they're gathering pollen to eat, and they're using some for themselves, and some they bring home back to their nest and give to their young. So there are all, so many kinds of pollinators. They all do different things. Some will just do it for themselves. Some will mainly take it back to the nest. But uh, those are the two basic reasons why. For honey. And then, well, yes, yeah, so they use the nectar and the pollen as part of their life cycle. And they'll go back and they will make honey from these ingredients and, and, and their own saliva, believe it or not. So why are pollinators so important? There's actually quite a few reasons why they're important. Um, one is because they make food for us. They say, experts think that about one in every three bites of food we eat is thanks to pollinators. So when you think of apples and berries and tomatoes, it's thanks to these little guys. And so I've got another question for you, true or false? Do you think we have chocolate thanks to pollinators? Do you think it's one of those wind-pollinated plants? Does anyone have an idea? Oh, someone, Gabriella says no, but Betty says yes. Oh, it's a tight run here. <laughs> Brandon's going with yes. Yes. What about the two people that said T and F? That said what? True and false. Yeah. So we got, we've got votes on both sides here. Okay. You don't so have to break it. Okay, so it's true, we have chocolate thanks to pollinators. There's actually one very teeny, teeny, tiny little fly midge type creature that is small enough to get into those flowers and is, is thanks to that little itty bitty creature that we have chocolate. Um, think about that the next time you enjoy chocolate, it's thanks to a little itty bitty fly. Wonderful. So another reason why they're really important is because they don't just pollinate plants that make food that we eat. They actually pollinate all kinds of plants that make food for other animals and have this important role to play in the ecosystem. We need all kinds of plants. We need a real diversity, a lot of variation in the plants that live and thrive in our country, especially our native plants, because they've grown here for eons and they've co-evolved with our wildlife. And so they both need each other. They're really important. And of course, pollinators are a big contributor to our economy. It's estimated over a billion dollars every single year is thanks to our pollinators and the services that they provide us. They also yep. keep insect populations in check. So when you think of lots of creatures out there, they're all got their own role to play. Um, but if there's too many of them, 
then what happens is they can become a problem. So in nature, one creature usually keeps another one in check. They're, they're food for different animals. So together, when there's balance, everything is in check. So hummingbirds, I think you may have seen hummingbirds at hummingbird feeders, but they really need their true natural food from flowers where they get the nectar. But they also need a large portion of their diet from flies and spiders, from insects and spiders, I should say, in general. They get protein from them. So they eat flies and gnats and all kinds of other insects. And there are other kinds of pollinators that at different stages, they actually predate, they eat other creatures. So we have some parasitic wasps that will go and catch um, caterpillars and take them back for their young. So they have very important roles to play, including with our farms in agriculture. We need these kinds of wasps to help keep these potential pest species in check so we don't become a problem, which means that we don't have to spray pesticides or as many pesticides on our crops. So there's a real connection there. So seven pollinators, we talked about it before. So bees and wasps, flies, butterflies, moths, beetles, and hummingbirds. And some of these pictures are coming to you from our wildlife friendly demonstration garden that we have around our headquarters in uh, the West End of Ottawa. Of course, taken over the years in warmer weather, but um, look at the one that's at like a snowflake kind of a flower. I love this picture because that flower is so incredibly tiny. I used a special camera and a special lens to take its picture. But it just goes to show when you slow down and you stop, you never know what amazing things you're going to see. And I was able to get a picture of a teeny tiny pollinator, maybe only, I don't know, two millimeters long pollinating at the same time. And then there's a, a bee there as well. So there's seven kinds. But of those seven kinds, can you guess which ones are the most important for pollination in Canada, which ones that can pollinate the most flowers as quickly as possible, they're very efficient, they can handle our cooler weather. There's, like, there's actually a couple that are high up there on the list. I'm wondering if you can think of one of them. Well, I wonder if anyone from Muriel Martin who's on watching on YouTube knows which most, which most pollinating. Mm, oh, Ava says bees. Um, mm. oh, lots of bees coming in. There's a big, strong bee, bee vote from Jessica and Aaron and James and Myla. Oh, my goodness. And Jenna and Chloe and Jamie, they're all saying bees. Oh, Lauren threw in a butterfly. So I, let's okay. oh, and lots of bees in the chat from YouTube, too. So, Sarah, who are we okay. voting for here? Okay, bees. <laughs> Actually, flies, flies are another big one. Flies are actually considered a really huge, important pollinator in Canada. So the next time you see a fly, you might actually want to give it a bit more respect. But bees are huge. They're a really big one. And on our poster, you can see we've got quite a few shown here in circles. And I just want to say a bit before we meet some of the bees, is that they have different ways of living. In general, some are social and some are solitary. So that means social bees, like you know, the honeybees, and to a lesser extent, bumblebees, they have a colony. So there's a group of them, big, big family that they're looking after and protecting. So they're a little more inclined to want to protect them if they feel we're getting too close to them because they're saying, hey, this is my home, my family, back off. Then there's other kinds that are solitary and most of our bees are solitary. So that means they, they emerge from their nest fully grown, they make a nest themselves, they mate, they lay eggs, they gather food and leave food for them, then they seal off the nest to protect it from predators, and that's usually the end of their life. Now, there is variation in terms of living with other bees of a similar species in groups, but they're usually solitary in how they function. So they have no interest really in protecting it from humans that much. They might protect it from other bees who might want to use their nest or eat their babies, but Basically, solitary bees, and most of our bees are solitary, are so gentle. They don't have stingers, a lot of them. And those that do have stingers, they can't even penetrate your skin. And the very few that could really wouldn't feel anything. So most of our bees are very docile, very gentle, and very beautiful, you'll see. So honeybees, um, you probably know them most. They're actually not native to Canada. They're definitely good for pollinating our food and giving us honey, which I personally love. But uh, there are a lot more efficient pollinators that are native to Canada. In fact, we have over 900 species, 900 kinds of native bees. 
And they actually need our help because they're in serious decline right now, a lot of them. Um, some of them are considered species at risk. So if we can help them by having habitat in our outdoor spaces with food, for some of them water, shelter, and no pesticides, that goes a long way in helping these creatures. And this is one from our gardens. Again, I just love the, the pattern on the wings. So delicate, so beautiful. It's feeding on a goldenrod. Okay, so the first bee, polyester bee. You can see it on the ground there of the poster. These are some pictures of the polyester bee. It's really neat. And it has a very special tongue with two lobes, like two tips. And it secretes a special substance into its nest, which is in the ground. And it lines it. And a lot of bees do line their nests. But this one has a special substance. It's kind of like a, a clear, thin plastic, like saran wrap or cellophane. And it protects it from water, from fungal diseases, even from so much water that they can actually nest in areas that flood because it's so waterproof, the lining of their nest. Another kind of bee is a mining bee. Now, I'm not sure if you can see much detail on your screen. But you see where the mining bee is in the corner? It's on a tree. And I'm wondering if you know what tree it's pollinating. We drew the tree with the leaves and the flowers. Normally the flowers come out first, kind of right now in my climate anyway. The, the red bud flowers are beginning, they're swelling, they're getting ready to open up, and the leaves come after. And this little bee, mining bee, comes out really early to pollinate this tree and willow trees. But I'm not sure if you guys, can you guess what tree that is? Oh, that's a good question. Now, while people are trying to guess the tree, we have a, a, another question, wondering if all plants need to be pollinated. It's coming from uh, Miss Johnson's class who's watching on YouTube. I don't know what every single plant, most plants do need to be pollinated, yes, and either wind or pollinators will pollinate it. Um, some plants can reproduce by sending their underground roots along and then sending up shoots and spreading themselves out that way. So if they can't get pollinated by their flowers, they can still spread and continue. Um, but yeah, plants really do need pollinators for the most part to be pollinated. So should I tell you what All tree right. that is? Well, Erin is guessing that's a mountain ash and James says it's a honeysuckle and Alicia wonders <laughs> if maybe it's a maple tree. Those are really good guesses. I'm impressed with your knowledge of trees. It is actually a maple tree. It's a red maple. So if ever, any of you have red maples in your area and you actually walk around, if you're going to go for a walk, look up and look to see if those flower buds are beginning to swell and get big and open up. And it's hard for us. We can't climb up the tree usually to see who's at the flowers, but just know that there's usually probably a mining bee up there pollinating it. And this is what they look like. There's a, again, we're talking about a group of bees, so there is variation in, in the coloring and, and the shape a little bit. But I wonder, can you guess why this bee is called a mining bee? Think about what mines are, where they are. Oh, that's a great question. Oh, they dig in the wood, maybe? Lauren's, Lauren has that guess. Okay, because a lot of mines. They're underground, and these guys, they dig holes underground. Like a lot of our solitary bees are ground nesting bees. Yeah. And so if ever you were to walk along an area where there's sand or soil or in a lawn, and you see a creature, you don't necessarily have to be frightened because it might be a ground nesting bee that's very gentle and may not even have a stinger. So always be careful. Always use common sense. But if you can observe from a safe distance, you might be amazed at what you see. And this little one here you see is a male one, and they sometimes have um, mustaches <laughs> with their fur. <laughs> Very cute. Mm -hmm. There's another kind of bee called a sweat bee. There's actually quite a few in, in this uh, family, in this particular group. They are beautiful, metallic green. And um, Toronto apparently has named one of those types of bees their official bee. And um, there's a picture of it down below. You can check it out on their website. But they're very, very cool. And some sweat bees, not all, but some sweat bees will actually land on your skin and drink your sweat because there's minerals in it. the salt. And that's how they get their name. So we shouldn't be swatting away all bees when we get scared because some of them need us. That's a very good point. 
a lot of these animals are so peaceful, just minding their own business, just doing their own thing. And again, a lot of them don't even have a stinger. Some are just too weak. Always be careful. Always use common sense. But you don't have to necessarily worry if you see something flying around you. Maybe it's just going to go and check out the flower behind you. Um, I'm going to talk about another creature soon that's very curious as well. Like she often will sort of hover in front of your face because they're just trying to check you out. So these bees, mason bees, you can see it's also kind of down below on the foot poster. They will um, come out early in the spring. They're also called orchard bees because they pollinate a lot of the, the trees in the orchard. So apple trees, a lot of other fruit trees like plums and pears. So when you're eating that lovely fruit, you can thank usually mason bees, which are sometimes encouraged on these properties. Um, people can have artificial homes where they've got like holes in wood because they are cavity nesters. They'll nest in wood. They also nest, as a lot of bees do, in hollow stems of plants or pithy, which means that they're soft stems. So if you grew sunflowers one year and if you left the sunflower stalk up or similar plants that have a hollow, emptyish stem, you might find that a bee will act go, hmm, this is a good spot to make a nest. And it'll go in and chew out any extra bits and it might even use those bits to seal off in between each little uh, section of its nest. I think this one might show a picture, there you go, of what some of their nests look like. So often they're like a long tunnel and it'll lay one egg and leave it some food and seal it off. Sometimes with chewed mud, chewed leaves, and they do that numerous times. And at the very end, it actually seals it off completely to protect it from the weather and from predators. So mason bees, again, if you have different hollow stems you can leave late until the spring if we can leave our spring cleanup of our gardens actually leave it in the fall and leave it as late as you can into the spring because a lot of little bees and crit critters might actually be getting ready to come out so we don't want to uh, tidy the garden too too soon so bumblebees i think we all know bumblebees they're soft and they're fuzzy and they're very very cute um so bees in general have special hairs to carry pollen on called scopa. And they can be on their legs and on their tummies called abdomens or on the side of their body, which is called the thorax. In the case of bumblebees and a few other bees in there in, in, them, in their family, they've got a very special way of carrying the pollen. On their hind leg, their back leg, they've got sort of a, a concave area. It's a bit of a dip. And around that, they've got these stiff hairs, which are specially designed to hold the pollen in place. So you can often tell a bumblebee, not just because it's big and fuzzy, but you can also see they've got this pollen sack or pollen basket building on their leg. Now, around our gardens, we have lots of native, pl native plant, uh, fl flowers, plants that we grow, and lots of bees and other insects come to them. And I don't have names for some of these, but I wanted to show them to you because they're so beautiful and you might discover some neat things in your garden, in your neighborhood. And it's just so much fun to watch and see. This, I think, might be a kind of a mining bee. And you can see it's got a pollen on its leg here. It's on a bellwort flower, which comes up early in the spring. And here are more native plants in our garden. And you can see they're all different kinds, which is a point I want to make. Our pollinators, all of them, need flowers at different times. Early in the spring, when they wake up, some of them are more active in the summer, some of them more active in the fall, or they need to eat in the fall to build up enough supply of food to survive the winter for those that do that. And here we have tiny little flowers. We have big flower, so big that that green sweat bees climbed into it. And then some are big enough that they can walk on it and they patiently go from flower to flower to flower. Because some of those flowers are actually big disc and there's actually little itty bitty flowers in the middle like sunflowers are like that and asters are like that it's all individual flowers and they patiently go one at a time to all of those flowers and here's one this is called a leaf cutter bee it has the scopa or the pollen gathering hairs on its abdomen and sometimes when they're feeding they stick their bum up in the air you can sometimes tell them because of where the pollen is and how they're feeding and there's some that are very specialized. They have to have a specific plant. There's a kind here that has to have this goldenrod to feed on. And um, our golden plants are just full of bees in the garden. In the fall. This is one, oh my gosh, this little bee is so tiny. It might only have been two or three millimeters long. 
And it's on a flower that's in the gardens in the spring called bloodroot. And of course, I made the, the, the flower picture look bigger here so you could see the, the bee in more detail. But it basically, I watched it went all the way around the edge of the, 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 the anthers on its side, gathering all the pollen and, and probably eating some too. And then this was in my garden last year. I grew herbs and I like to leave some to go to flower. And you think herbs, flowers, they're so tiny. They're so inconsequential, but they're not because we have so many teeny tiny little pollinators like this little guy. It landed and it looked in and it went in and went to get its food. So if you can leave some, some annuals or some flowers, some herbs in your garden to flower, that would be great. So we talked about bees and now we can talk about wasps. Now people may hear the word wasps, like wasps, stay away, they're awful, they're terrible. But I want you to so Sarah, look at them. Sorry to interrupt. I, I, we just have so many questions about bees. Before we move oh. on, I'd just like to ask a couple of them, if that's okay with sure. you. Yeah, sure. So, okay. One question that came off of YouTube is how many different types of species of bees are, are there? Because you were talking about so many. Is that all of the types or are there lots there of different are. types of species? Okay, so there are over 900 known species of bees in Canada. And the way we organize that information, because there's so many kinds, we actually have everything. All plants and animals are grouped by families. They've got a certain characteristic. Mm -hmm. And within families, you've got gen genus, genera, that... Again, they're more specific, but they share certain characteristics, like maybe how they live or their color or their size or how they feed. So I was showing you some of the genera with a group, some of the groups, but there's many more groups of bees in Canada to show you. And of course, species, there's just so many, and we're still discovering more. And which is another point, you might find that you guys might help us discover something new about any of these creatures. So when you go exploring, keep in mind, if you notice something, you might want to share it. Mm -hmm. Now, there's mm. lots of other questions that are, are about bees, but I know you have many interesting things about our other pollinators. So if you've asked a question about bees and you didn't hear me say it, no worries. We're going to save some more till the end because there's lots of time at the end to get more of these questions out. So back over to you, Sarah. I can't wait to All hear right. about wasps. Great. Yeah, so there's three kinds of wasps in general that people worry about the, the yellow jackets, the hornets and the paper wasps. And for good reason, they have colonies and they protect them. And they feel threatened if you're too close, they will sting and the stings are not, not comfortable. And some people are allergic to, to different stings too. You have to be very careful and very mindful and use a lot of common sense. But I don't want anyone to think just because they see a wasp, they have to be panicky or worried. There are many times, like when I took a picture of this wasp from the left it was just busily going about its business getting food I got right up close to it very calm very peaceful and I took pictures of it and it left me alone it had no interest in me whatsoever because it didn't have anything to protect I wasn't threatening it by trying to squish it and get too close so it didn't feel it had to protect itself and I wasn't right next to its nest so it didn't feel like I was going to be a threat to their family so it's always a matter of common sense um, if ever I had a nest started, you know, by my back door, I removed it right away. That was because there's no way they could feel safe if I'm going in and out of the door and the nest is right above it. But I had a nest up in the house. They never bothered us. In the tree near our house, and they've never bothered us. I've been sitting on my my front steps, and a, a paper wasp would land next to me on the banister, and it would scrape very slowly, scrape some wood away. Hardly anything for our eyes to notice, but just enough to take back to its nest, to build its nest. And we were so peaceful and, and I was completely safe the whole time. So always take care, always have common sense and be sensible. Just don't feel like you have to freak out and start running and screaming and swatting because if they sense that behavior, they might get afraid themselves. So just wanted to say that about wasps because they are also useful pollinators and they also help our farms with keeping pests in control. So I want to show you a picture here. These are like bees, they are solitary wasps. And most of our bees, our wasps, sorry, are solitary. So they're friendly, they're safe. Their stinger has nothing to do with stinging people and protecting. Their stinger is only about catching prey and immobilizing it so it can't run away. Then they take it back to their nest and they feed it to their young because they're a lot like the solitary bees. They'll make a long nest. They'll lay an egg and leave it some food. They'll seal it off and away they go. So they do not want 
to any, to harm us whatsoever. They're very peaceful. And I bet there's lots of solitary wasps out there we don't even know about. This one here, um, you can tell it's a nest. It's a kind of isodontia wasp because it'll, at the very end, it'll shove dried grasses in and it looks like the bottom of a, a broom. Some people call it the witch's broom wasp because of the way it looks. And again, they're totally harmless, these particular solitary wasps. Then we talked about flies. Flies are really important pollinators in Canada because of our climate, that the flies can handle our climate. And some of them, they look a lot like our wasps. These ones here are shiny and yellow and black. And they're not, they're actually little flies. And they're the ones I was mentioning earlier. You might get a little fly that comes in front of your face and zooms and zooms and zooms, hovering in front of your face. They're curious. They want to know who you are. Sometimes they'll even land on your finger if they feel safe enough. They're very, some of them are very tiny, like two or three millimeters, and some of them are larger. And you can see the same hair is easy. have some hair on them, so it does help them transfer pollen from flower to flower. And while the adults might feed on pollen, their larva, the young form of this fly, um, or this group of flies, they actually feed on uh, aphids. And we, you know, that's a big help to gardeners because aphids can you know, be a problem in gardens if there's too many. So that's, and again, that, that lovely balance that happens in nature. And this picture is it's just two very similar insects, but I'm not sure if you can tell the difference. You see the one on the right has the pollen basket. So I can tell that's a bumblebee because of its look, its size, and but on the left, that's actually a kind of a fly like in the family of the hoverflies. It just looks like a bee now. So sometimes you might see a fly that looks like a beer wasp and it actually is a fly. And it's on a really cool flower called button bush. I think it should be called ball bush because it's like a round ball. Very, very cool. So beetles also, some of them do pollinate. In this case, the checkered beetle. And again, the adult will feed on pollen, but the young will predate on wood boring insects and grasshoppers and, um, and some of bees as well. But again, that's nature. And it's a kind of a beetle, but it's called a fly. And I'm wondering if you can think of what beetle has the name of a fly in it. And this picture is kind of a clue. If you look at all the pretty lights, and I'll give you another clue. We had a lot of them last year. Last year, I'm not sure all across the country, but my area is very moist. And they love moisture. They love moist tall grass. They love dampness. And they put on a gorgeous show in the evening and nighttime. Mm, when you're camping, you see them all the time. We yeah. have lots of guests coming in. Aaron and Aiden and Declan and Betty and Jamie, they're all saying, Firefly! That's great. Yeah, so fireflies are a kind of beetle. And again, we're still discovering so much about them. We don't know all of the species of fireflies. We don't know all about how they live. But we do know that enough of them do pollinate as adults. And as young, again, they will feed on some other creatures that help, help us keep things in check. So moths are another kind. Not all moths feed. Some of them only live for two weeks and then they die and they don't even eat. But hummingbird clearing moths are a kind of a moth that flies during the daytime and they do eat. And they've got their name because they're very similar to a hummingbird in how they feed. They don't land on the flower. They hover in front of it and they feed while they like tubular flowers so they can, they can get right at the nectar at the bottom with their special mouth parts. And of course, butterflies, um, they're another pollinator. And here is an example with monarchs. So again, they've got different forms. They've got the young form and the adult form. Adult monarchs, of course, need flower nectar, but the young form caterpillars, like all butterflies, need leaves. They've got very special leaves they go to. Some go to tree leaves. In the case of the monarch, they have to have milkweed leaves. And a lot of our monarch populations, perhaps you've heard, they've been declining, like with some of our bees and our other insects. They don't have the food that they need to live, or they might only be patches here and there in, their, in the country as they travel across Canada and America and Mexico on their migra migratory route, or even when they're here during the summer. There's often too much of a gap between feeding stations, for instance. So the more you can plant native flowers in your garden to help these creatures, the better. And remember, they do have to have milkweed. Some milkweed will spread. 
So depending on the province you live in, check out and see what you're allowed to plant because um, there's different species and some don't spread very much and they're very useful for monarchs. Then we have butterflies, the Canadian tiger swallowtail. This is another kind of butterfly, very beautiful also. Some butterflies like the swallowtails do something called mud puddling. You can see them on the bottom corner there. They're on the ground. It looks damp. It's like it's damp sand. They're using their mouth, their proboscis, to get the minerals from the damp sand. They also go to damp earth, compost. And if you live near a river and you've got washed up, you know, dead stuff, they'll go to that and feed on that too. I've uh, got a picture here from our parking lot, actually, in the top left. It was a dry day. But there was this beautiful question mark butterfly. I'd never seen one before. There was a slight crack in the parking lot with a bit of earth in it. And even though it was a dryish day, it was damp enough that it could feed and get some minerals from the ground. So you never know what you're going to see and what it's doing. I made actually with a friend of mine at work some insect dishes to give our butterflies and some other pollinating creatures some water. So there's pebbles for bees and maybe some wasps to land on and get a drink. And then there's damp sand for some of those mud puddling butterflies to get some food. Then we've got hummingbirds. Um, of course, they do pollinate some, not as much as the others, but they still go flower to flower and get some pollen that they transfer over. So we talked a lot about pollinators and who they are, and we talked a little bit about some of their needs. So when you think of how you can help them, if you can grow some wild flowers, some native plants that still have nectar and pollen, because some people, some people are changing the plants around and they have less nectar and pollen. It's great if you can get those that still have nectar and pollen. Or if you grow some herbs, let a few go to flower. And if you have annuals, there's a picture here of a hummingbird at an annual called zinnias. My daughter and I love growing them every year. They're very easy to grow. They've got lots of pretty colors. And you can get the kinds with the old traditional kind with just a few petals, not big poofy ones that are harder to find the food. Those open ones are lovely for them to, to eat. And you can also enjoy the delicious food that pollinators give us. You can go outside and look for them. Where are they? Are they high up? Are they low down? Are they in a tree or on a flower? Are they on the ground? What are they doing? And you can tell your friends and your families and your teachers and your neighbors why you like pollinators. And anything from this talk that you might find interesting and share with them. Spread the word. So we have a website if you want more information. And during this time when we're at home from school and, and work, there's um, a special section to give you and your families ideas of what we can do safely to learn about nature and, and um, stay occupied. And then the coloring pages you can download as well. So I'm not sure if you want to keep this up a bit longer. The next slide just has my email address that you can email me if you want a copy of the pollinator poster, which again, because offices are closed down now, we're working from home, we won't be able to send out right away. Have, we have to wait for things to change and go back to normal before we can do that. So there would be a, a bit of a wait. So there's my email address for you. So I'm putting that and I'm putting um, your email in the chat. Mm -hmm. And so if anyone wants to reach out Great. to you, they can do that there. So it'll be here in the chat and everyone will be able to see it right now. Okay, great. Um, um, if you are on our YouTube and you're watching, um, I can. we can also put this, we'll put this on our website, we'll put it on our Facebook, we'll send it to your teachers. And so there'll be lots of ways that you can get in touch with Sarah. Now, now Sarah, there are so many questions that have come. Um, I'm, if you could stop sharing your screen so we can see you and we'll see all the students as well. All right. And maybe if you're on if you're on our conference right now, um, not on YouTube, but here on the conference, if you would like to ask a question, I'm going to put the screen big so I can see almost everyone. Just wave your hand and I'll write down your name and we'll get you. Oh, look at all those questions. Everyone has questions. Well, <laughs> before we get started with all the people, on, I'm going to go to one of our YouTube questions. And someone was asking, of the seven pollinators, do you have a favorite? Ooh. Oh, that's hard. I sometimes think I do, and then I see another one, and I think, oh my gosh, you're so beautiful and amazing, and I have another favorite. So I definitely have a soft spot for bees when I'm in the gardens and I'm looking at them and taking pictures of them. I'm just amazed when I watch them. They're beautiful. They're clever. They're they're gentle, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but I love the hoverflies, too. They're absolutely adorable. 
And I love the butterflies and I love the fireflies. I'm sorry, it's hard to pick favorites. It is. And they were they're all so beautiful. Like the little mustache one. What was that one again? That was a Mason bee. Oh, I was I was, was like, I want a bit. <laughs> was that a Mason bee or mining bee? <laughs> we'll check because I think that yeah. Mason bee? No, that was a mining bee. Mining was bee. A mining okay. bee. Yeah. Well, it was my favorite. <laughs> All right. So whoever is joining us from Aqualuit and he has a question. And then we are going to go to um, Jamie and who says Jamie and Jojo. And then we're going to go to Lily, who's wearing a pink striped shirt. So those are our next three questions. So first River, then the Jamie and Jojo and then Lily. OK, River, it's you're up. How long do bees live? Oh, that's a really good question. And it's kind of complicated because, because there are so many species of bees and they've all got such different lifestyles. Um, you know, some will only live a few weeks and some will live several months. Um, the queen bumblebee, for instance, she will live throughout the summer. She'll actually also live through the winter and then she'll, on her own. And then she will next spring emerge and start her colony. So they're probably the longest living ones. Um, they, so they can live obviously very, very, very many months, but for the most part, only a few months or a few weeks, I think. Wow. Thank you for that. All right. Jamie and Jojo Pruce. Are, are you guys ready? I can un... Yeah, I'm going to unmute you. Oh, it's not working. Okay. Jamie and Jojo, if you'd still like to ask a question, you're going to have to unmute yourself, but we're going to go straight to Lily now because we don't have a lot of time. So maybe even type it. Lily? Do you know how to unmute yourself? Oh, yeah. awesome. And then Riker, we're gonna come to you. How does the queen bee become the queen bee? Well, I think you're gonna have to talk a little bit louder, just. How does the bee become the queen bee? Oh, how does the bee become the queen bee? Oh, I know, it's a, it's a very good question. And I don't know much about honeybees because I study, well, I learn more about the native bees. So in terms of the, the bumblebees, um, <laughs> I don't know how they how it's selected, but I do know that you know from one year's colony, um, these will emerge and they will um, fly off, and they will eventually start their own colonies. But how they choose them, I really don't know. Interesting. Okay. All right. So Jamie and Jojo, I saw that you unmuted. Would you like to ask your question now? And then we'll go to Riker. He'll be next. Yeah. Oh. Does every flower need um, to be pollinated? You know, I'd like to say yes, but I don't know about every single flower in the world because there's always exceptions to the rule. But I think most, most, most flowers, yes, do need to be pollinated. Every single one. I'm, I'm not an expert enough to, to answer 100% on that, but I think most of them do, yes. Okay. Awesome. Awesome question. Thank you so much for asking that. So we're going to go to Riker next. And, then, oh, and so if you have a question, Riker, you can unmute now. There you are. Um, how long does it take to make a beehive from when they leave their other nest? Good question. So if you're talking about bumblebees, um, She'll emerge from her, her sleeping place in the winter, in the spring, and she'll start going to all those early spring blooming flowers that hopefully we have for them. And she'll be gathering, gathering uh, the food that way for the young that she's going to lay. And she'll be looking for a nest then, and then she'll look for a suitable spot, perhaps in the ground or perhaps in a, a low area, like a cavity, an old insect home. Um, and, then, and then she will build it from there. So I don't know exactly how long it takes, but um, I imagine over the several weeks, she's, she's building her food sources, she's creating the nest. And then as some of those eggs hatch and they become workers, they help build and, and, and work on the colony as well. I just see I have to plug in my laptop. I'm going to be right back. Hang on a second. <laughs> All right. Oh, the power and technology. It's always. So I see the question from Mississauga. I see you're holding up that wonderful sign. It says, how do bees make honey from nectar. So we'll, we'll throw that one over to Sarah when she's back. And then I also see that Kay Holden has been raising your hand. And so you'll be next. Sound good? Awesome. So Sarah's okay. question was, how do bees make um, honey from nectar? 
The, and then so there's different thoughts about honey too, because obviously the honeybees make honey. We know that as that. And um, they use the nectar from the flower. They use a little bit of their own saliva. And it's a long, complicated process that I've, I've learned about, but I don't know it well enough to understand all the intricacies. But for bumblebees and our solitary bees, some people consider it honey, some people don't. But bumblebees will, again, do something similar in terms of using the nectar. They'll also use pollen, which they, they put together to make their pollen bread, which is like food for their young. Um, and again, that the nectar with the saliva can make something else, uh, a kind of a honey. And because we have so many different kinds of bees, they all behave a little bit differently. Some will get more nectar or more pollen. Some will carry um, the nectar in a special crop inside their bodies and bring it back and then use that in making food for their young. Um, they're all so different. And the more I read and learn about them, the more amazed and fascinated I get. There's no one absolute way of saying it for all of our native bees. Um, and again, for honeybees, it is more of a complicated process, but I hope that answers your question a little bit. Wonderful. Thank you. So we have, we'll go to Kay Holden and then uh, we have a question from YouTube and then Ava and Jace have raised their hand in the chat feature. I forgot about that. So in the chat box, there's a little raise your hand and you're welcome to push that buttons because then we remember that you want to ask a question or you can put it in the chat. I saw Mallory just put a question there. So you can also put it in the chat. So Kay Holden, YouTube, and then Ava and Jace. All right, over to you. Sounds good. Uh, I just want Pre Shepherd from Prescott School in Spruce Grove has been wondering if there are underwater pollinators. Oh, yes. Huh. I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> I don't know of underwater pollinators. Um, I know, for instance, if you're thinking of some of the plants that grow in our lakes and rivers, they'll often grow the plant part up above the water level and the flower will usually be above the water like our pickerel weed and our um oh my goodness water lilies and such um i don't know i'm not aware of any if there are that is a very interesting question i had not Ooh. even thought of that yeah me neither <laughs> um we get such smart kids here they just ask us challenging questions i, I love it so from YouTube, they're wondering about the life cycle of a bee and how that works. And I saw Mallory's question was similar, like how does the life cycle of a butterfly work? So what's the sort of, do they have similar life cycles or can you explain it in, in a few seconds? <laughs> well, yeah, so insects in general, because again, they're all quite different, but insects in general, um, the adult will lay the egg. The egg after a time will a sort of hatch and be a sort of the larval form of them. And it's sort of like a, like a, a it can be a caterpillar in butterflies. Uh, it can be sort of like a little maggot looking in flies. It can be like, it's just the larva is kind of like that, that soft bodied version of itself, which again, it will grow, it will pupate and, and eventually become the adult that we see flying around now. So depending on which species we're talking about, it might have a few steps in between. So some caterpillars, they actually have um, different stages. So they'll be a little itty bitty caterpillar and then they call them instars. And then the next stage will be a bit bigger. They'll shed their skin and then they will be a bit bigger caterpillar. And sometimes they can change when they're very small caterpillars, they can look like bird droppings. So they're disguised so that they're overlooked and they're not looking delicious food for birds and other creatures. So they will grow and grow and grow and get bigger. And then the caterpillar when it's the, the, the largest or the most developed form of its caterpillar stage, it will then build its cocoon and within which it's transforming into a butterfly. Now, how it does that, it's amazing. And so some of our butterflies actually need plants to do this on. They need the leaves to eat as caterpillars and then they'll hang their chrysalis on the, the leaf of the plant. Some of them will be um, in the trees. And some of them, like that hummingbird clearing moth I showed you, it will, it will evolve quite a bit in the tree, feeding on uh, leaves of cherries and, and whatnot. And then it'll, it needs to drop down below the tree to the leaf litter. And it, there it, it'll continue its evolution into its adult stage. Unfortunately, a lot of our trees don't have leaf litter under it. We're very tidy in our gardens, which is lovely in some ways. It's almost finding that balance. How can we have some leaves that fall naturally from the tree, which, which helps the tree roots? 
How can we leave that and still have a nice looking garden to help a lot of these species of butterflies and moths that do need to fall down and develop in that leaf litter? There's so many different ways that they develop. It's really, really complicated, but it's amazing as well. So wonderful. Sorry, I started to talk there when we were still muted. Yeah. <laughs> so someone had a question that um, we're going to go to Ava next, not Ava 7, but Ava. But but as we go over to Ava and she unmutes herself, um, someone had a question that is sort of part of that life cycle is when they're caterpillars, can they act as pollinators? Like, do they like walk through pollen and spread it like without knowing it? Can they be pollinators in earlier stages? That's a neat question. Um, Again, there's so many kinds of pollinators and there's so many species within and they all have so many different ways of being. But to my knowledge, I don't think so. I think caterpillars are predominantly on leaves, leaves of trees or leaves of plant, uh, flowering plants instead. And they've evolved over you know, the millennia to be the perfect match for those plants. They never take too much. They just take enough of what they need. And so being on the leaves, I don't believe they do pollinate. I've not heard of that. I could be wrong because again, we're still discovering new things. So maybe you guys will discover something that we didn't know before. That's so amazing. We can all be scientists. Yes. All right, Ava, I see you've unmuted. So go ahead and ask your question. Where's a good spot for bees to make their hive? Okay, well, that's a very good question. And again, it depends on the kind of bee we're talking about. I talk about the, the native ones because they're the ones that live here that need our help. So the, some of them are ground nesting bees. So if you can have an area of your garden where perhaps it's sunny and you don't have too many plants there, um, perhaps that that's where they can make their nest. Um, if you have mulch in your gardens, I've learned to have very light, fine mulch so they can dig through into it. If it's too thick and heavy, they can't dig into it. Then there are the cavity nesting bees. So let's say you had... Um, a tree stump in your garden because you had a tree and it died and it got cut down. If you can leave enough of the tree stump there, then some bees have the strong enough jaws to chew into it and make their nest that way. Some of them, um, we actually take blocks and we can drill holes. Um, we're learning not to do put too many of them together in too big of a structure because it can attract predators. So small little blocks would be nice. Um, some of them live in the hollow stems of elderberry and raspberry and, and other and other things. So what we're saying to people is, if you can, leave some of those stalks be or trim them down to not too low. So in case there are some bees in there, they have a chance to finish their, their cycles because some of them will be finished by spring. Some of them go on through the fall. Some of them overwinter. They might overwinter at different stages. They're all so complicated. But if you can help them by having some bare ground in a spot or hollow stems or a little bit of wood that they can, they can nest in there for the different kinds that are out there. So wonderful. Thank you so much, Ava, for that great question. Now, if you want to see everyone on your screen, you can hit up in the corner, there's something called gallery view or speaker view, and it gives you a good answer. If you want, just want to see Sarah's um, lovely big face, you can see it like that, or you can hit <laughs> and the poster, you can see hit the gallery view and see all of your friends who are online right now too. Now we still have a few more questions. So Jace was next, if you'd like to unmute your microphone, and then we're gonna go to Abdullah and then Ava7 if we have time. Now, if there are any more questions on YouTube, We'd love to ask them as well. We only have four more minutes. It's been such an exciting session. It's gone so fast. And I can't wait to hear what Jace has to say. All right, Jace, over to you. How do bees make their nests? Okay, well, again, that's a great question. And with so many kinds of bees, they're all a bit different. I showed you a picture of a leafcutter bee. It had the pollen on its lower body, on, under its abdomen. They're the ones that stick their bum up sometimes when they're feeding. Leaf cutters will cut little bits of leaf and they'll, they'll put them in their, their long nest and they'll roll them up to make the lining of the nest. And they'll chew some of those leaves to make the, the, the partition, the ceiling of the nest. And some will use mud, some will use um, dried grasses. There's so many different ways that they will use things they use to make their nest so they'll they'll often they'll make the little long little tunnel whether it's in the ground or it's in a stem or it's in the wood and once they've got their tunnel they'll if it's in the ground they'll often line it with a secretion from their mouth to seal it off a little bit 
but then they'll also need to get materials to seal off in between all the different cells of their eggs that they're laying and at the very end to protect them. So they'll either go to the ground to get mud, to get earth, they'll mix with their own saliva to make mud, or damp ground helps, of course, um, leaves. Um, so variety, a lot of things you have in your garden are perfect that the bees need to make their nests. That's so amazing. So even if we can't help them by maybe um, keeping the, their their cocoons around or like every little thing we do can help protect pollinators. Absolutely. There's so many little things we can do that are simple and easy, but it goes a long way to help these really important and amazing creatures that we share our country and home with. So amazing. All right. So we probably have time for one or two more questions. I know Abdullah um, that you had a question. Can Do you know how to unmute your, your iPad there, buddy? I think I can. Oh, no, you're going to have to. There you go. You're on. Do bees kill other bees and do they have enemies? Another good question. Okay, yes, yeah, so there are definitely some creatures that will eat bees. I think sometimes some birds will eat bees. Um, sometimes other insects might eat bees. But yes, there are even some bees that will kill other bees. There's a kind of a bee, and there's a few species of them called cuckoo bees. So what they'll do is they won't actually make a nest of their own. They won't go gathering food for their young. They're going to find where there's a bee nest already made with already food laid. And they'll go in if they can, if they can get by the, 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 the mother. Um, it hasn't been sealed off yet. And they'll go in and they'll lay their own eggs. And sometimes they will kill the eggs or their young will kill the eggs that are already there. Sometimes they'll kill the, the, the female that's made the nest. So there are a few species called cuckoo bees that do that. There's a cuckoo bumblebee. Um, there's, a, there's a few of them. There's a cuckoo sweat bee. But that's a really neat question. Oh, I wish we had time for more, but here we are right at our time to, to end the day. So if you've asked a question and Sarah wasn't able to get to it, I would suggest that you take your question and you put it into Google or you go to the Canadian Wildlife Federation website and see if they've already answered it. Because um, I see there's like, how much do bees eat? Do males and females pollinate? How do they know where to build their nests? These are all amazing questions. And I'd yeah, like you to find the answers. So, and I know Sarah would as well, but unfortunately <laughs> we're out of time for today, but I wanted to say thank you to all of you who joined. There was 58 people on the Zoom link here and then another over a hundred watching us live on YouTube. And I'm just so excited that Brayden and I and Sarah were able to share this day with you. So thank you to everyone from Ontario and Nunavut and Yukon and BC and Saskatchewan and, and Manitoba and everyone who joined us today from all across our amazing country and asked wonderful questions. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you in two weeks for our invasive species. And we're going to be sending the link online you will be able to join and ask more questions of a specialist from canadian wildlife federation and uh, i think sarah has one last thing to say before we go but i want to thank sarah maybe we can all eat don't unmute but maybe you can all raise your hands and clap and she'll see everyone clapping for her yay thank you sarah for joining us and i'll turn it over to you for any final words before we log off today and just to say, I'm so thrilled that you all came here and participated. That is so wonderful to share my love and enthusiasm of pollinators with you guys. And there is information on the website. I'm working on a huge section that I'm hoping will be uploaded later, if not this spring, then this summer, a lot of what we talked about. But there's also something called iNaturalist, where you can take pictures and share it with other scientists. It's on the website that I gave you. So go check it out and see what you can find. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for Bye. joining us. See you again soon. Thank oh, you. And enjoy your honey from your pollinators. <laughs> <laughs>